Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the new Lenovo Slim 7 Pro X. This is a laptop that I think might be really nice for creative professionals, but also college students. This one has a lot of graphical horsepower on board. It's got a new Ryzen 6900HS processor along with an NVIDIA RTX 3050. So it'll do well with video editing and a little bit of game playing as well. And we're going to take a closer look at what this laptop is all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this came in on loan from Lenovo. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new laptop is all about. Now the price point on this one is around $1,400 or so as configured. I don't think it's all that unreasonable given the performance levels we'll see out of it in a few minutes. All of the different configurations have a 14.5 inch display. This one is an IPS display that covers 100% of sRGB. It is running at a 3K resolution that is 3072 by 1920 and it has a 120 hertz refresh rate so it feels nice and snappy and this one has uh, touch controls on it as well as you can see here. This is not a two-in-one though, so the uh, display here will go down just about flat, but not uh, flip around into tablet mode. That's what their yoga devices are designed to do. As I mentioned at the outset, this has a Ryzen 6900HS processor. Now this is the first computer that I've looked at this year that has a new Ryzen 6000 series processor on board. And one of the things we'll look at over the course of this review is how this processor performs on its own with graphically intensive applications like video editing and gaming. And we'll compare that performance to the GPU that's also on board this computer to see what kind of advantages you get from a GPU still. Uh, this GPU is an RTX 3050. It has four gigabytes of video RAM and it runs at 55 watts. And that's the power rating that we typically see on these thinner and lighter laptops when there is a GPU on board. It has 32 gigabytes of regular memory for its other tasks on board as well. That's DDR5 RAM. The RAM though is not upgradable. It is soldered on. So you'll need to choose the amount of RAM you want when you purchase it. And this one has a one terabyte NVMe SSD and that SSD is upgradable. It's very well built and not that heavy. It comes in at around 1.45 kilograms or 3.2 pounds. And it's very well balanced here as well. So you can lift up the display here with one finger or one hand and not have the keyboard come up with you. And then of course you've got that nice touch screen for navigating things. There is no fingerprint reader on board, but it does do facial recognition with its built-in webcam, and it can do that automatically when you walk up to the computer. And like many of the newer Lenovo's we've looked at over the last couple of months, there is a 1080p webcam here at the top. It's got a bit of a bump there to accommodate the larger sensor. The image quality is looking pretty good on these new cameras. It's not quite up to broadcast quality, but it does look a lot better than the 720p webcams we were seeing on these machines a year or so ago. There is no manual shutter on this, but there is a switch here on the side that will disable the webcam. And you'll see an icon light up here on the screen when you uh, flick that position. So that will disable the webcam, but you're not gonna have a physical shutter blocking the lens like we've seen in prior versions of Lenovo's hardware. And I really like the keyboard and trackpad on this one. The key layout is your standard Lenovo layout. The keys are large and well spaced, but this one also has a good amount of key travel to it. At least it feels like it does. So typing on it feels nice with a decent amount of tactile feedback. The keyboard is backlit. The trackpad here, as you can see, is quite large. It's got a very nice firm click to it. So it feels very accurate and really nice to use. And this is one of the better keyboard and trackpad combos I have seen on a Lenovo device. You've got speakers here on the top of the lid. They sound great. They're not uh, quite up to audiophile quality, of course, for music, but it's adequate for music and certainly adequate for web conferences and spoken word, YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. So if you wanted uh, better music quality, of course, plug in headphones, but I think the speakers here are just fine. The case itself is all metal on this one. It's got a really nice solid feel to it. 
Now, as far as ports are concerned, you've got a USB-A port here. This is a 3.2 Gen 1 port that'll run it up to 5 gigabits per second, but it's a full-size USB-A. And then you have two USB Type-C ports here. These are full service ports, and these both support the Gen 2 10 gigabit standard, but not the faster USB 4 standard. But you can plug your power adapter into either one of these ports. The power adapter supports up to 100 watts of power, and you will get a warning when you boot the computer up if the power adapter is less than 100 watts. So if you are looking to choose a docking station to pair up with this machine, make sure the docking station supports 100 watts of power over the USB-C cable just so that you can get the best performance out of the computer. Because when you've got a GPU on board, it has power requirements in addition to everything else that the computer needs to power. But you do have two ports here for plugging stuff in, and again, both full service for video out, uh, power in, and of course, data in and out. On the other side here, we have another USB-A port. This is another 3.2 Gen 1 port that runs it up to 5 gigabits per second. Your power switch is here. You got your headphone microphone jack over here. It's good to see that they're still making those. And then you have your switch here for the webcam that we talked about earlier. So let's take a look now and see how it performs. We'll start with the basics and work our way up from there. And we'll begin with a little web browsing here by visiting the nasa.gov homepage. And as expected, everything is really fast and responsive here, primarily because this thing has a lot of processing power on board to accommodate basic tasks like this. And of course, you also have the touch display here that you can navigate with. So no issues on the web browsing front. And a little bit earlier, we checked out a 60 frames per second video on my YouTube channel. We didn't see any drop frames or any playback issues as we were testing things out. So I think it'll work fine for all of the streaming apps out there. Additionally, this supports Dolby Vision. So if you have Netflix or one of the other video streaming apps that support HDR video, you'll be able to get a little bit more out of the dynamic range uh, if those things you're watching support it. And you will need to download the Windows Store apps for those services to be able to take advantage of that better visual quality. And this display has about 400 nits of overall brightness. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test running in Google Chrome, we got a score of 210, and that puts this one fairly on par with some of its peers in the marketplace. Now, as far as battery life is concerned, I think you can get about seven to eight hours out of this, provided you keep the screen brightness down and stick to basic tasks like what we were just doing on the web browser. If you are going into more intensive applications like video editing or gaming or anything that might make use of the NVIDIA GPU on this, you'll start to see less battery life depending on the task that you're doing and how much it is stressing the CPU and GPU. Let's take a look now at one of those more intensive tasks, video editing. So here is DaVinci Resolve. This is a nice free video editing application that's very powerful. And I have two 4K60 clips here strung together. And I just want to drop in a transition so we can do a nice cross dissolve between one clip and the other. So we'll drop that in there between the two clips. I'll lengthen it out a little bit. And as you can see here, it does a very nice smooth transition because we've got the GPU on board. A little earlier, I took this shot of the same activity done with the internal Ryzen processor. And as you can see, a simple task like this is a little more sluggish perhaps on the Ryzen versus the built-in NVIDIA GPU here, but it's kind of a marginal difference. Although I think if you started doing more complex applications or complex video effects, that might make it a little bit different. So for example, if I drop in this rotation effect here and scroll back, we'll see if that can render that in real time, which it does. And if we go back to the clip where we just used the Ryzen processor for editing, you can see it struggles a bit more with that transition. And I think if you have a lot of complex video editing to do where you've got all these transitions, where you've got additional rendering, where you've got color grading, all of those things will really benefit from the NVIDIA GPU on here. So even though these Ryzen chips are getting better and better, so too are the lower end discrete GPUs. 
And I think there's still a good argument for using a discrete GPU for an intensive creative application like video editing and like live video streaming and other things where having that extra boost really makes a difference. Another area where it makes a difference is gaming. Let's take a look and see how Red Dead Redemption runs first on the GPU and then on the Ryzen chip. All right, so we've got the game right now running off of the GPU and we're getting about 70 to 75 frames per second depending on what it's rendering in the game. It all feels very smooth and certainly north of 60 frames per second. This is 1080p at the lowest settings just to have a good basis of comparison here. So you can of course tweak things to get the right combination of fidelity and frame rate. Now let's take a look though at the game running off of the internal Ryzen processor. So here we are running the game just off of the Ryzen processor with the same exact settings. It's about a 30 frames per second penalty in performance over the 3050 GPU, but I was surprised that it wasn't a greater difference in performance. This is running really, really nicely, north of 40 frames per second almost all of the time, which is awesome to see on just the built-in processor. And I think we're going to see a lot of really cool, high-performing, thin and light laptops over the next couple of months that will be able to run games like this at very playable frame rates. So it's clear that AMD has really upped the performance here on these Ryzen processors. Let's take a look at the 3D Mark Time Spy test. There we got a score of 2,795 running just on the Ryzen 6900HS processor here. And you can see that is besting an i7-1260P from Intel that was in a Lenovo Yoga 9i we looked at recently. And you can also see that this new chip is significantly faster than the last two variants of these laptop Ryzen processors. If we move over to the same test running off the GPU, you can see that that 3050 does much better, 4038 versus 2795, and the frame rates are certainly better on those tests running from the GPU and the GPU here is performing about where it was performing on the HP Spectre X360, which has the same GPU with the same level of power going into it. And other games run just fine off of this 3050 GPU. This is No Man's Sky, and we're looking at about 130 frames per second, give or take, at standard settings, 1080p. So I've got some room here to make adjustments to improve the graphical fidelity, uh, but all in the gaming performance out of this is very, very nice for a thin and light laptop, thanks to that RTX 3050 GPU on board. And the fan noise on this is not bad at all. We've got the game here cooking the CPU and the GPU, and although the fan is on and I can hear it, it is not offensively loud. You do want to keep the bottom here clear. That is the air intake, and it exhausts underneath the display here but it doesn't get too hot to the touch here. It's certainly warm right now, but not alarmingly so, and I think they've handled the thermals quite well. We also ran the 3D Mark stress test, and there we got a passing grade of 98.5%. We did not get CPU temperatures out of the test. It just didn't display them for us, but the GPU came in at 65.2 Celsius or 149.3 Fahrenheit. So I think they've got everything pretty well tuned here to deliver consistent performance without a lot of fan noise to distract you. Now we always like to try to boot up Linux on these machines when we get them in, but as you can see here with this one, we're having some trouble getting Linux to boot up. We've been testing Ubuntu 22.04.1, which is the latest version, but it looks as though this hardware might be too new to get everything fully recognized. So we are having some trouble on the Linux side here. I would expect Linux compatibility to improve as these chips make their way out into the marketplace. But at the moment, uh, it doesn't look as though you can get Linux working reliably on this machine. We did try to disable safe boot also. That didn't seem to make much of a difference here. So not much luck here on the Linux side, unfortunately. I think that'll change in the near future but it is a very nicely priced, well-rounded laptop. It's got plenty of performance. It's not all that big and heavy. And I think if you're someone who's been looking at the Mac but not quite pleased with its gaming compatibility, this will certainly play those games quite well and edit videos nicely too. You may not get the battery life that you get out of an M1 powered Mac, but the compatibility is certainly here. And if you are looking for a nice Windows laptop, 
this is definitely one to consider. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.